So, so uh, thanks again, Bill, for organizing this. So a very quick introduction about me and the company. So Reality Engines.ai is a research-oriented company that's focused on solving very hard problems that businesses face uh, in AI and machine learning. For example, some of the problems that we are working on now uh, include uh, training machine learning models with less data and uh, uh, more machine learning and AI-assisted automation of machine learning pipelines and finally, um, research and explainability and bias. And uh, I'm a research scientist at Reality Engines AI. And uh, right now I'm working in research on explainability and bias. Uh, my background includes uh, a bunch of different topics in machine learning and artificial intelligence. And more recently before Reality Engines AI, I was working in ethics and AI. So uh, that's a very broad overview of what we do and uh, about me. And if you want to learn more about uh, the research that we are doing, you can uh, sign up at realityengines.ai uh, to stay tuned for latest updates from us. So uh, coming on to explainability and bias, uh, there has been a lot of interest in both the research uh, community and the industry over the last few years on uh, explainability and bias. So why is this happening right now? So in the last decade or so, there has been a significant rise in the amount of machine learning models that have been deployed in applications and domains that have a lot of uh, life impacting decisions. But unfortunately, almost all of these models are black boxes and they're very hard to interpret and understand. And even uh, experts that uh, deploy the, these models have trouble understanding these models. And uh, even worse, some of these models, they end up learning human biases and they act unfairly towards large groups of people. One particular application that has gained a lot of attention in the last uh, few years in the media is, is the Compass tool. So this tool is a, an application that's used by courts when they decide whether a particular defendant should be granted bail or not when they are undergoing trial. So what this tool does is it takes in background information about a person and it outputs a score from one to 10. And if the score is uh, higher, it means that there's a higher likelihood or higher probability of the person reoffending or committing another crime. And if it's low, it means that there's a lower probability of the person committing another crime. And uh, here you see an example of the tool lab labeling a black female as high risk and a white male as low risk. Uh, it, so without much information about uh, these two cases, it uh, doesn't seem particularly uh, striking. But if you look at the backgrounds of these individuals, you see that this white male had uh, a number of serious prior offenses. For example, he had a couple of armed robberies and uh, the black female didn't have any major prior offenses. And in fact, the white male did go on to commit a significant uh, future offense, but the black female didn't commit any other offenses. So this tool sort of, this one tool uh, an application sort of uh, paints a good picture of for why we need explanations from our model and why we need to measure and see whether our model has biases. And this was uh, brought to light by this uh, organization called ProPublica, which is an investigative uh, journal outfit, which uh, found out that uh, when they analyzed this tool, that non-recidivating black people, that is people who don't go on to commit future crimes, were twice as likely to be labeled as high risk than non-recidivating white people. So uh, does this mean that the tool is unfair? Uh, we'll answer, it, it's, a, it's a complicated question and we'll be answering that question later on in the slides. And on to explainability. So beyond just being uh, useful for laypersons that might use uh, machine learning models, uh, explanations will also be useful for developers and engineers that build these models. For example, if you have explanations that might help you uh, debug and build models faster, just like uh, having uh, insight into how a normal computer program behaves will help you debug the program better. And there might also be a legal need for explanations in some domains. For example, if you're a bank and if you have a machine learning model uh, to decide whether somebody should be granted a loan, then you might be required by legal reason, uh, by the law in some countries to provide explanations for denials of loans or loan applications. So with that said, how would you go on about uh, building explainability or building explainable models?
So one easy way might be to start with machine learning and AI models that are already explainable and are very simple and easy to understand. Uh, for example, uh, decision trees are very simple models and are easily understandable and interpretable. For example, if you are building a decision tree model for the compass domain, uh, you might have a model that looks like this. Uh, it might look at the number of prior offenses and if it's zero, it might label the person as low risk. And if it's greater than zero and if the person has committed an armed offense, then the person will be labeled as high risk and otherwise the person will be labeled as medium risk. By just looking at this uh, figure and spending a few seconds, it's easy to understand what the model does and you can present this to laypersons and have them understand what the model does. And uh, you can not only get a good picture of uh, an individual uh, input to the model, how an individual input was uh, predicted, but you can also sort of get a global picture of why the model behaves in a certain way. So why can't we just use simple interpretable models? Unfortunately, there's a well-known trade-off in machine learning, uh, which uh, sort of looks like this. So the idea is that uh, on one hand, you have simple models such as decision trees and linear models. Uh, they are very easy to understand and you can give them to non-experts. But the problem is these models are generally not as good uh, when it comes to performance, when you compare them with models such as deep learning models that work well in a number of different domains and work well for a number of different problems. But unfortunately, uh, very powerful models such as deep learning models are very hard to interpret and understand. So you have this sort of very informal graph that shows that uh, the more explainable your model is, uh, the less the performance. And you can sort of think of uh, the whole purpose of explainability research as being towards uh, moving this line upwards so that you get more explainability for the same levels of performance. And uh, there are many different explainability methods uh, people have proposed in the last uh, few years. Uh, one particular class of methods known as feature attribution methods have received a lot of attention uh, in the industry and academia. So what do feature attribution methods do? Let's say you have a classifier. It can be any arbitrary classifier, such as a neural network or a decision tree or some random black box. Uh, you don't care about the classifier here. You just consider the classifier to be a black box. But what you're interested in is how the classifier behaves on a particular input. And uh, you want to explain the output for that particular input. So you have an explainer that takes as input, your input, your classifier, and the classifier's output and it produces as output a set of feature weights. So the idea is that uh, the explainer thinks that the classifier considers these weights to be important, these features to be important for this particular input uh, in producing a particular output. So how do we uh, work with these uh, models, methods, and what features do we use when we want to explain uh, these uh, inputs and outputs that we give to classifiers? So we want to use interpretable features. So in general, it's very hard for laypersons to understand raw feature spaces. Uh, uh, for example, let's say you're building a text classification system. You might be using uh, something very fancy such as word embeddings, uh, but you can't uh, present feature weights for word embeddings to laypersons and have them understand the model. Uh, the intuition is that humans are very good at understanding presence or absence of components and in inputs and we should be leveraging this when we want to explain how a model behaves. And that brings us to the notion of an interpretable instance. So the idea is you take your input instance in some random feature space that you use for your classification model or your regression model. What you do is you convert your input instance into a binary vector that indicates the presence or absence of words in your input. For example, if it's a text uh, input, text instance. And, for, and if it's an image, what you do is you convert your input instance into a binary vector that indicates whether certain pixels are absent or not, or whether certain contiguous regions are absent or not. So at, at the end of the day, you convert your input instances into a binary vector that uh, shows, that represents whether something is present or not in your input. And we try to explain how the classifier behaves by using these features rather than the original features. So that's the background and that brings us to uh, one of the very first uh, feature attribution methods that 
gained a lot of traction and it's called LIME, which stands for locally interpretable model agnostic explanations. And it was introduced in 2016. And uh, you can get this, you can get the system at this GitHub link. It's well documented and well uh, maintained. At a very high level, what it tries to do is it tries to explain a model use very highly non-linear model using a, a locally linear model or a locally interpretable model. And we'll go through a very high level overview of how Lime works. So Lime takes as input any arbitrary classifier and it can be uh, a classifier that has an arbitrary shape or an arbitrary classification boundary. It can be highly non-linear such as this uh, show, classifier shown here. And you want Lime to explain how the classifier behaves on a particular input. For example, the guy shown in blue here. So once you give these two things as input to Lime, what it does is it samples uh, around your around the input that you're interested in. It, it comes up with uh, other examples or other input instances around the input that you want explained. And it sort of weighs them by how close they are to your input instance. So the more closer they are, they, they get higher weights and uh, they are shown as being bigger in size. And Lime then converts all these instances into binary vectors. So those will be our interpretable instances. So you convert this into a bunch of ones and zeros. So you have a nice data set uh, with uh, your points being in the interpretable feature space. Once you have this, you can build another classifier and in this case, you want to build a linear classifier to explain how the classifier sort of works in the small region of space. And once you have this, once you have a linear classifier in this case, you can uh, use the weights for the linear classifier to get feature importances. So the weights directly co uh, correspond to feature importances. So high positive weights indicate that uh, uh, that particular feature was important in moving the classifiers output to a high positive value and high negative weights indicate that uh, that feature was highly instrumental in moving the classifiers output down towards a negative value or the regression models uh, output down towards a highly negative value and low absolute weights indicate that uh, those features weren't that important and you can get a more sparser set of feature importances by enforcing some sparsity constraints on your model so that you can get a lot of zeros for features that aren't important. So you get uh, only a handful of features that you, that the model thinks are important. So how does it look like? Uh, let's say you have a toy example here. Uh, and let's say you're dealing with a text sentiment classification system. And let's say you want to classify this particular input. The movie is not bad. And uh, your classifier gives a very high positive score to the sentence because it indicates a positive sentiment. And if you feed this to Lime, Lime might probably give zeros to words that are not important in your input. For example, the movie is uh, probably not important to judging the emotion in the sentence. And uh, not is uh, highly instrumental in moving uh, the classification to a high positive value because not when it combines with bad, it indicates that the whole sentiment is positive rather than negative. And bad indicates a negative sentiment, so that why that's why it gets a negative value here. And you can see, you can already see how this might make a very uh, highly non-interpretable model sort of in, uh, easy to understand or interpretable for particular instances. And you can also apply Lime on images. Uh, in this case, we are looking at a classifier that produced uh, a label cat for this image. And you can see that Lime thought that the classifier uh, found the region shown in green to be highly important in pushing the classifier's output towards cat. And Lime thought that uh, the region shown in red, which is a dog, was uh, important in pushing the classifier's output away from cat. And you can also use Lime uh, to explain multi-label classifiers. In this case, you will get uh, multiple explanations. Uh, you'll get explanations for each label from your classifier. Quite intuitive and simple. So in this case, we are looking at uh, this guy who's uh, playing an acoustic or an electric guitar with uh, a Labrador mask or a dog that's uh, 
I don't know what's going on, but you can see that the classifier output three labels in this case, uh, electric guitar, acoustic guitar, and Labrador, and you can query the classifier to show explanations for the different labels. And uh, those sort of make sense in this example here. So that's uh, on using Lime for explanations from your model. You can also use Lime for debugging if you are developing machine learning models. So let's say you're developing an image classification system. And let's say uh, your classifier labeled this image of a husky as a wolf. And it seems like a reasonable mistake to make uh, because uh, huskies look like uh, wolves. Uh, but uh, if you query the classifier for why it produced this uh, label, you might find out that the classifier used uh, snow in the background to label this uh, image uh, as that of a wolf. And it found out that wolves are generally found in snowy background regions. And so therefore they thought that this particular dog was a wolf. So you can see that even though uh, it seems, even though the classifier seems to have made a reasonable mistake here, it doesn't seem that reasonable when you look at the explanations because it was using features that it shouldn't have been using to produce the final output. So if you, if you find something like this when you're developing a model, then you can uh, go back to your features or you can go back to your model and do some more tinkering to make your model better. And you can also use this for debugging uh, text-based models. Uh, uh, in this example, we are looking at a text classifier that's used for classifying emails. And uh, so the example is shown on the right and you have the prediction probabilities and the explanations on the right. On the sorry, you have the prediction probabilities on the left. And uh, for this particular example, you can see that the classifier used words that words and uh, features that it shouldn't have been using. For example, it was using uh, the domain name from the email header. For example, it was using OwlNet, and it thinks that's a very highly important feature in this example. Also, ideally, when you're building a classification system uh, for emails, it shouldn't be using things such as domains to judge the, to classify the content of the emails. So if you see something like this, you might do some feature engineering, for example, to remove the headers and footers from your emails and just feed in uh, the body of your email to the classifier. And you might get something that looks a lot more reasonable. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, the classifier produced uh, uh, labels, uh, uh, Christian, uh, Middle East, and some other labels, and you can see that uh, for the Christian label, uh, the words, so the words and explanations roughly correspond to what you might expect from the classifier. So that's Lime. That was uh, one of the very first feature attribution methods that came out. And around the around the time that Lime came out, uh, several other similar methods came out, but uh, slightly different uh, takes on how you assign weights to features and how you handle different kinds of models. And uh, people found out that you can sort of unify a lot of these different feature attribution methods into this one method called SHAP. And SHAP unifies methods such as Lime and uh, other methods that are called integrated gradients and Shapley values and deep left. So what is SHAP? So SHAP comes from game theory. Particularly it comes from uh, the portion of game theory that's used to assign values to players that participate in cooperative games. So what, what does this mean? And what exactly are Shapley values? Let's say you have a set of n players that are participating in a game. And let's say you have a function v that assigns payoffs to different groups of players. So the function is just concerned with who is in your group uh, and, it just, uh, and it assigns a score based on the membership of the group. And what Shapley values do is they look at the uh, score for the whole group uh, or the payoff for the whole group, and they provide a way of dividing up the whole score or the whole payoff fairly amongst all the end players in your group. So that's the high level uh, definition of Shapley values. And how do you comp compute Shapley values? So let's say uh, you, you are interested in the Shapley value for player i given a, play given a payoff score v. So what you do first is you look at a group that doesn't have the player i and you compute the payoff without the player i in the group and what you do is you add the player to the group 
and you compute the payoff again. So that's the score on the left. And you take the difference between these two scores. So that shows you how much the player contributed to this particular group. And what you do is you do this for all possible groups of players. And you sum up all these uh, contributions across all these different groups. Once you do this, you take the average. And that gives you the Shapley value. So how does this connect with explanations? Uh, that's a very direct uh, connection with explanations. If you think of players as features, and if you think of the payoff as being the model's real value of prediction, uh, there are some more uh, subtleties in translating Shapley values to Shap, but uh, uh, we can uh, ignore them for now. And there's a very well maintained and documented implementation for Shap that you can get at uh, this URL here. And uh, this implementation includes different kinds of explainers, explainer, explainers. For example, you have a tree explainer that's used for getting fast and exact sharp values for tree-based classifiers such as XGBoost or CatBoost that are used in a lot of machine learning competitions. And then you have a kernel explainer that's used for computing approximate sharp values for black box models. So you can feed in any classifier that you have and you can still get sharp values for those uh, for that model and you have deep exp explainers that are more uh, high speed uh, explainers for explaining deep learning models and you have some other explainers that are slight variations on sharp so now let's look at a, an example of how sharply values look at when we use them with the model and the model that we'll be using is an XG boost model that was trained on uh, the UCI adult income data set. So in this data set, the goal is to predict the probability that some person will make over $50,000 in a particular year. And as inputs, you have a lot of uh, data about the person, for example, their relationship status and the number of hours they worked and their education and their gender and the capital gains and so on and so forth. And this is an example, this is an output that you get from SHAP. And uh, I'll explain this. So what you have is you have a base value from the classifier. So this is sort of the average value across your data set. So this is the average probability that somebody will make over $50,000 in a particular year. And that's 0.248. And for this particular instance, the classifier thought that the person will make, uh, that the person's probability is less than the base value and it's 0.16. And you can think of the distance as being the distance between the base value and the output value as being uh, the feature attribute scores. So let's say you start with the base value, which is the average value from the classifier. And let's say you have a feature F10, F41, for, sorry, that has a particular Shapley value, Sharp value. It's a, it's a negative value. So what it does is it, lowers the base value and you have another feature f3 that also has a negative value it's shown in blue because it tends to decrease the model score that also lowers the base value further and then you have another feature that has an even higher negative value that lowers the base value even lower and then you have a feature f34 that has a positive sharp value what it does is it uh, tries to move the classifier's output higher. And then you have another feature F87 that tries to move the classifier's output again higher. And then you finally stop here because you'll, uh, you have considered all your features and that'll be your output. So the way to read this figure is that uh, if, you, if you look at the difference between the blue bars, the length of the blue bars and the length of the red bars, that'll be equal to the difference between the base value and the output value. And uh, for completeness, here's another uh, explanation for another input that was fed to the same model. In this case, the model thinks that this person is highly likely to earn more than uh, $50,000 and assigns a score that's very close to one. And uh, so by just looking at these explanations, you can sort of see why the model thinks, or you can sort of understand how the model works. For example, the model thinks if somebody has made a lot of capital gain in the last year, then uh, uh, it's highly likely that the person makes more than 
$50,000. But if the person is a wife, then the model uh, seems to think that it tends to lower their score of making more than $50,000. So you can see the data set of the model is sort of slightly biased when it comes to relationship statuses and genders. And uh, if you look at the second explanation, it's even more uh, easy to see uh, how the explanations contribute to moving the model's output from the base value to the model's output value. So another uh, thing to keep in mind is that all these explanations are model dependent. They're not uh, data dependent. They're data dependent, but if you change your model for the same data set, you can get uh, highly different explanations. Uh, so these uh, show the models, these show sharp explanations for two different models on the same training set and on the same input instance. Uh, in the first model thought, a lot of features were important uh, in computing the model's output. But uh, the second model thought only some features were important in computing uh, the output. And as you can see, the model's outputs are different. So just, uh, so that's a very high level overview of SHAP and LIME. So uh, with this, you can ask whether this form of explainability is enough. Uh, but uh, unfortunately it's not because this form of these explanations, they don't provide us with three goals. So what exactly is recourse? So recourse is the information that you can use to change uh, a prediction to a specific or a desired value. For example, let's say you're uh, dealing with a loan application and your loan application is rejected. If, you just, if you're just given Lime or Sharp explanations, it's very hard to see how you might use, or use those explanations to move your prediction to a more positive value. Ideally, we would need something along the lines of, uh, say, uh, if you had, if you had earned more than ten thousand, if you had earned ten thousand more do dollars in the last year, then you would have been granted this loan application. Or if you had paid your credit card balance in full for the last six months, then you would have got that loan. So, in the ideal case, we would we would want explanations to provide recourses and actionable uh, output like this. Uh, you can sort of get an idea from this from uh, looking at sharp and line values, but those uh, explanations don't give us a full picture. And there's still research going on to give us a uh, diverse set of uh, recourse, recourses from models. There's another issue, major issue with sharp and line. Uh, sharp and line values tend to be highly variable uh, when you deal with highly nonlinear models. So in this in this figure, we are looking at sharp and line values when you when you're working with a linear model, uh, they don't change that much across the input space. Uh, but if you're working with a highly non-linear model, you can see the sharp and line values sort of flipping around in a very small region of the input space. And uh, IDD shouldn't be the case. It, uh, you should be able to you should have similar explanations for inputs that are similar. So one issue with having highly nonlinear, highly variable explanations is that it's very hard for laypersons to predict how the model will behave on future uh, inputs when you're given explanations. And uh, there's some research going on uh, to correct this. And uh, uh, so the people, the group behind Lime has come up with a new form of explanations called anchors that tries to reduce the variability of explanations. And they ran some user studies where they presented users with Lime explanations and anchor explanations. And they found out that if you present them with anchor explanations, they were able to <clears throat> predict how the model would do on future unseen inputs. So the take home message when it <clears throat> comes to explainability is that explainability is definitely possible and it need not come at the cost of performance. But on the other hand, the forms of explainability that we have that are sort of well-developed are not enough. And we need things such as recourse, et cetera, when we deploy these models that interact with laypersons. So that uh, finishes up the explainability part of the webinar. And then we'll now move on to bias. Uh, and I think this might be a good time to stop for a few seconds to see if there are any major questions.
So I think the first question is what biases, I guess. Uh, uh, we'll be covering it in the next few minutes. And the next question is how Lime is different from KNN models. So, uh, so KNN models are classification models. And uh, so they are, uh, you use KNNs to build black, you use class KNN models to build classifiers. And Lime is an explanation system. So Lime can take as input a KNN model and produce explanations. So I think there are some more detailed questions, but I guess uh, uh, we could cover them at the Q&A session after the uh, talk. So on to bias and fairness. So what do we mean by, by bias in this context? So very generally, you can think of bias as the absence of fairness or the presence of unfairness more or less. And uh, it's important to keep in mind that this form of bias is different from uh, the standard statistical bias that is used in machine learning. And this is the bias in the bias versus variance trade-off. <clears throat> and uh, for completeness, this is uh, a very high level definition of uh, statistical bias in machine learning. And it's defined as the difference between the expected value of your model uh, versus the true value. Uh, we needn't be worried about the exact details here, but. Uh, just to keep in mind, there are two uh, words with the same. There are two words with, there's one word with two different meanings. So bias uh, in this context, unfortunately, it doesn't have one definition. There are many, many di uh, d different definitions of fairness or bias. And all of these definitions are application independent. And unfortunately, no definition is uh, better than some other definition. Uh, just to get a taste of all these different definitions, I uh, recommend that uh, you see this talk titled 21 Definitions of Fairness by Arvind Narayan at uh, ACM 2018 Fat Star, which is a new conference on fairness and bias. And the key point of his talk is that there are more than 21 definitions of fairness and not just 21. And uh, all of these definitions sort of uh, uh, matter in different uh, contexts. We look at some definitions here, and uh, the basic setting for these definitions is this. We have a classifier C that has uh, binary outputs that are labeled positive or negative, and the classifier also has a real valued score S. And the instances or data points that we are dealing with are generally humans or associated with humans. We are not interested in bias or unfairness in the context of, for example, let's say image classification or uh, classifying handwritten digits. And uh, for convention, we take the positive class as being desired and the negative class as being undesired. And we have an input X. And within this input X, we have one or more uh, protected or sensitive attributes, for example, gender or race. And uh, some set of instances that share a, a sensitive attribute, for example, uh, males or uh, white people might be called privileged if they receive a lot more positive labels. Once again, this depends on the application and, and on the context and uh, the groups might be switched or depending on your application. And the rest of the instances are called unprivileged and they tend to usually receive a lot less positive labels. And you have the true output Y. So given the setting, one of the simplest possible forms of fairness or uh, bias removal that you might try is fairness through unawareness. So the simple idea here is that you don't consider any sensitive attributes when you're building the model. You just omit the sensitive attributes from uh, your data representation. For example, you don't consider race or gender. And this seems to have some advantages because it seems to have uh, some support in, in law in the form of a concept known as disparate treatment uh, that sort of requires uh, us to not consider these sensitive attributes. But one big disadvantage is that you might have other attributes that are correlated with sensitive attributes, such as uh, job history or ge geographical location when it comes to race. And your model might end up 
uh, inferring or learning about those sensitive attributes through these other attributes. So this generally is not a very good idea to uh, use in practice. You can sort of try to improve upon this by considering what is known as statistical parity difference. So in this case, what you do is you say that different groups should have the same uh, proportion of fraction of positive or negative labels from your classifier. And you can do this by minimizing this formula shown here, making this formula as close to zero as possible. And once again, this does have some advantages and uh, it, it also seems to have some support in, in the law in the form of a rule known as the four-fifths rule. And it also has another advantage in that it might remove historical bias. But it has a big disadvantage in that it tends to admit a lot of non-trivial, sorry, a lot of trivial classifiers. For example, you can have a classifier which randomly assigns positive and negative scores, the same fraction of positive and negative labels to different groups, and you can have the classifier sta satisfy this definition or you can have a classifier that, uh, that assigns only positive labels to all your instances, and it will still satisfy this definition. And another bigger disadvantage is that this system, this definition doesn't allow you to use a perfect classifier if your ground truth rates of labels are different across different groups. So how do we improve upon this? So you can sort of improve upon this by requiring that you consider not just different groups, but also, uh, groups that actually have positive or negative labels within those groups and you say that uh, groups that have positive labels across groups should have the same positive uh, fraction of labels uh, for example if you're looking at race you consider you look at each race and you look at uh, the amount of people of a certain race that actually have the positive label in reality and you see whether your classifier assigns the same fraction of positive labels to those different groups. So one big advantage is that it does let you use a perfect classifier and uh, the perfect classifier might satisfy this definition. But there are some uh, major disadvantages. Uh, so one big disadvantage is that this might perpetuate historical biases. For example, let's say you're building a hiring application classifier and let's say you have 100 privileged uh, people and 100 privileged applicants, but 40 are qualified in the privileged group and four are qualified in the unprivileged group. And you can satisfy this definition by hiring 20 from the privileged group and two from the unprivileged group. You can still satisfy this definition. But if uh, the, the disadvantage is that if you're with things like hiring, this might tend to perpetuate historical biases because uh, better job opportunities might carry on to future generations and so on and so forth. So, uh, so what this suggests is that you might want to consider application specific definitions. Uh, once again, if you're dealing with uh, an application that is punitive in nature, like the compass score, you might say that you want to look at false negative scores and you might require that the false negative rates be same across different groups. And this is what ProPublica did when they considered the compass tool and they found out that the false negative rates were different across different races. So this seems like a reasonable definition for fairness and uh, in this context, but uh, the company behind Compass, what they did was they were considering a different definition of fairness. They looked at uh, scores and they said that if you have the same score, then you should have the same uh, uh, outcomes for the same for the same score across different groups. So the idea is that uh, uh, no matter which group you belong to, uh, if you receive the same score, you should have the same probability of being classified as positive or negative, or the same probability of being positive or negative in the real world. And this is the definition that North Point, the company behind Compass, was. Uh, relying on. So can we have both these def uh, different definitions be satisfied when it comes to this particular application? It turns out that you can't and uh, there are results that show uh, when you have different rates of prevalence uh, prevalences across different groups, you can't satisfy these two different definitions of, of fairness. In fact, there are many such impossibility results that have come out in the past few years that show that in general, it's very difficult to have more than one or two definitions be satisfied in the same application, unless you have a lot of other different conditions satisfied. 
So, so those cover just a small fraction of different uh, bias definitions. And uh, there are a number of open source tools uh, out there for measuring uh, uh, the amount of bias that you might have in your classifier or data set. And one of the most uh, well-documented and complete tools out there is uh, this toolkit known as AAF360 from IBM, which has uh, around uh, 20 different definitions of fairness and bias implemented. So let's say you have uh, a classification model and let's say you use one of these tools to measure whether you have bias in your model and let's say that you find out that your model is indeed biased. So the question now becomes whether you can remove bias from your model. It turns out that you can indeed remove or at least reduce bias in your models. And this is known as bias mitigation. And this can happen in three different places. You can apply bias mitigation before your model is built in the training data or when your model is being built or after your model is built with the predictions. And I'll go through uh, these, uh, uh, some of these algorithms very quickly. So once again, looking at the Compass uh, data set, you might have a classifier that has an accuracy of 66%, let's say. And let's say you measure two forms of bias, statistical parity difference and equal opportunity difference. And ideally, these should be close to zero as possible. But let's say you, you're, not as, you're not within a band around zero. It's, let's say it's uh, biased in bo both of these cases. What you could do is you can uh, apply this bias mitigation algorithm known as reweighing. What it does is it looks at your data set and it assigns different weights to different instances. It increases weights for unprivileged, lab unprivileged instances with positive labels and privileged instances with negative labels. And similarly, it decreases weights for unprivileged with negative labels and privileged with positive labels. And then you build your model with this data set. And when you apply this algorithm, you might find out that it, at least in this case, it does reduce bias and it uh, doesn't have much of an impact on accuracy. And an algorithm that you can apply when your model is being built is known as adversarial train learning what it does is uh, it tries to predict your sensitive attribute from your output it attaches a, uh, another model on top of your model that tries to predict your sensitive attribute given your uh, uh, model's output and the model in turn tries to reduce this adversary's accuracy and once again if you apply this on the compass data set you might find out that uh, it does reduce uh, your bias goes to an extent. And uh, in this particular case, it uh, does also increase accuracy a little bit, uh, but it need not be the case in general. And finally, you might also apply mitigation of your, after your model is built. One simple mitigation algorithm is known as reject option classification. Well, so what it does is, it, let's say you uh, have a classifier that outputs a probability score. And now uh, if your probability score is around a band, uh, near 0.5 that is if your classifier is uncertain what you do is you uh, change the label to positive if the instance is unprivileged and you change the label to negative if your instance is unprivileged and now once again you can apply this to your model and uh, uh, it's, it's highly empirical and you might see some changes in your bias course for this particular example it reduces the bias course but it, it also reduces the accuracy slightly So that uh, covers uh, some definitions and some bias mitigation algorithms. And uh, there are uh, more, some more bias mitigation algorithms. AAF360 uh, has around 10 more uh, bias mitigation algorithms. And uh, it's usually an empirical process to decide which of these uh, algorithms to use given any particular application or system. Uh, And uh, that brings us to the end of uh, the second part of the webinar. And the take home message is that when it comes to bias, uh, there are many different forms of bias and fairness, and it all depends on, on your application and context. Uh, and ideally, you might want to have a system that not only uh, explains your model, but also tries to explain why your model is biased in some particular instance. And, uh, and, and another message is that bias in general can be decreased 
uh, with a number of different algorithms. There might usually be some trade-off in performance, but it needn't be the case in general. So that completes the webinar. Great, thanks, Navi. Uh, do you uh, have you go through the event, uh, the questions in the chat, and also in the QA okay. session? Yes, uh, I'm going through. Okay. So there's another. Okay. So how do you? I, I see a lot of questions in uh, the chat window, and uh, let me. Okay. So is there any preferred order that you want me to go through this bill? Okay. Uh, you can probably just go through from the beginning and uh, there's some... Okay. So let's see. So I think we stopped here uh, with Pavan's question on how Lime is different from KNN models. And uh, we were looking at, uh, I think we have to consider Margaret's question on uh, let's see. How about that one? What is a deep lift? Is this one already? Okay. Yeah, I think so. That's a, so deep lift is a, is a feature attribution method that was proposed for working with uh, deep learning models. And uh, it was shown after it was proposed that uh, sharply values can subsume deep lift. And uh, that's a, uh, and uh, and after that, uh, the deep left people they took some of uh, Shapley's improvements and they made it put that back into deep left. Uh, so you can either use deep left or uh, if you if you're building uh, models that are a bit more diverse than just non than just deep learning models, then you might use uh, Shap along with Shap specific explainers for deep learning. And. Uh, So this is a good question from Richard. So this question is, uh, could you give an example where clients were happy with? Yeah, so this, uh, so happiness is highly objective. So in general, people are happy to have some insight into why a model behaves in a certain way. Uh, so it's uh, uh, people in general, uh, in the medical community and in the finance community, when they are building models, they want to have something that they can show as output uh, to lay persons that are, using these models. Uh, I think there are well-documented examples of uh, fraud classification systems, for example, that uh, give us explanations uh, on particular instances. But uh, that said, I, I would say this field is still under research and things like recourse uh, might make people even more happier. Uh, and uh, looking at Margaret's question, is the variability in Lime and Shap with nonlinear models dependent on the roughness of the nonlinear surface? Yes, I would say so. It's dependent on the model that you're using for classifying or regression. And it's uh, locally unstable. So, uh, in the example shown, not bad was positive. Why is it not neutral? Uh, so I, I guess that depends on uh, how, uh, on uh, the location where it's used. I, I guess when people generally say something is not bad, it uh, tends to be uh, a compliment. And uh, whether this is used in NLP, yes, this is used in NLP. So explanations will be uh, words that are important or not important. And I think I had a couple of slides on how this is used in uh, NLP. I don't know if my slides are still visible. But... So line calculates feature importances using a linear model. Uh, and I think we went through uh, some slides on how this works. So it sounds what you described is not biased due to a model, but biased due to a particular data sample. So, so at the first, in the first half of the seminar, we looked at explanations for a particular sample. Uh, 
but uh, in the second half we looked at how a classifier in general might be biased or how uh, there might be bias in your data set so margaret's question was uh, how would i don't think i fully get this question so i'll skip over to the next one so edward's question is how uh, whether bias can be caused by Im imbalance in the training data set yeah that's a good question so there can be many sources of bias so one common source of biases are uh, due to uh, differences in measurement uh, for example in the compass example uh, your ground truth labels are from policing records and uh, policing in general tends to be very highly uh, unevenly distributed across different geographical locations so in general locations which have a lot of police presence tend to have a lot more re-arrests and a lot more arrests so that can measurements can be one form of bias and bias can also creep in due to historical factors So yes, uh, bias can indeed happen due to imbalance in the training data set. So this is asking about the tool that uh, that we referenced. So this is uh, the AI Fairness 360. Uh, and I think the GitHub link is there in the slides and we'll share the slides after the talk so you can look at it later. And uh, Dennis is asking whether synthetic data can be used to augment bias data sets. Uh, yes, uh, it can be used to augment bias data sets. So there's some research in this direction using what are known as uh, counterfactual instances. So what they do is they look at a particular instance and say what would have happened if this person's gender or race were switched. And they either train the model with that or ask for the model's predictions on this. Uh, it's hard to say which domains or industries uh, techniques in general tend to be useful. It, uh, right now, it's mostly an empirical uh, field. You have a set of tools and you have a set of measures and then you just try those uh, different measures and tools and see which works best in your context. And uh, how can law and regulation be designed better? I, I think education matters a lot. I think uh, just educating lawmakers on uh, how a lot of these systems work and uh, the limitations of these systems uh, will be a big uh, first step in making law and regulation work better with these systems. Yeah, and this question from test is also another good question. Uh, yes, I, I would consider all of these to be as part of uh, interpretable or explainable methods, methods such as counterfactuals, influence functions, and adversarial examples. Uh, in general, uh, for many reasons, they tend to be not that well used due to a number of reasons. Uh, So I think some of these go into a little bit more detail. Uh, let's see if there are. Yeah, and I have to agree with Jeffrey that uh, it's not just the developers that have to, uh, that should be given control over how to do bias mitigation. Uh, it should be a lot of other stakeholders. Uh, And in general, uh, finding and mitigating bias can take definitely take more resources. And uh, in general, it can also impact performance. And uh, there's still research on dealing with instability of explanations. It's still a research topic. And uh, there are some tools such as anchors that have been proposed uh, to help deal with instability. But uh, I wouldn't say they have found that much widespread use. Uh, 
when you compare them with tools such as Lime and Sharp. Yeah, I, and Julio's question is on whether taking, uh, whether explaining with respect to just one class. I guess you can do that. Uh, so, in general, you can uh, explain with respect to any other output value rather than just the models uh, output over the training set or some background set. Uh, in finance, for example, it's uh, required that you explain with respect to some reference set of uh, people. Uh, for example, people have, that have got the loan. And uh, there's one question on explaining a random forest model, uh, which is a collection of trees. Uh, it's in general, it's very hard to explain random forest models other than using Lime or Sharp or other explainability methods. And Christine's question is on answering whether uh, the model is just explaining. Uh, that's true, it's not explaining the model globally, it's just explaining how the model is behaving on some input. Let's see if I have skipped out any other. So uh, Jeffrey's question is on how uh, legal some of these techniques are. Uh, I mean, this uh, needs to be studied even more. Uh, that's a very good, uh, I mean, right now it's only, right now the situation is not that ideal. You have machine learning researchers and computer scientists sort of working in isolation. They don't talk uh, that often with uh, stakeholders in law and other industries on how uh, appropriate some of these measures are. So there needs to be a lot of conversation and research on these questions. And I think there's a final question from Abhay Rajon, whether one 